I just came back from completing the Mount Everest Base Camp Trek and there's some gear that I really wish I had with me for the trek. Things that would have made my trek a lot easier, maybe a little bit safer, a lot more enjoyable. And I don't think these items are just applicable to that trek. I can see using this gear for pretty much any hike anywhere at any time. So there are seven things I'm going to share with you today and then one thing that I'll kind of discuss just a little bit at the end and then it will be the subject of a whole video all on its own. Okay, the first item still on the package is some altitude sickness prevention medication. I did my trek in the middle of May and I started getting my immunizations and doing my medical checkup sent, getting everything ready for my international travel in about back in February. And that's when I started asking for the medication. Um, my doctor wasn't really familiar with this type of medication. Um, and so um, I was told that she would get back to me and I try to be respectful of that and to give people um, the time they need to look into things and get back to me. So about a month went by and I sent a follow-up email and then another month went by and I left a couple of voicemails and um, I left <laughs> without it. Um, about a week before I was calling frantically saying like, I'm leaving in a week, I'm leaving in a week, like please send the medication. Um, and I'm a military veteran, so all medication comes in the mail. So um, I, was, I was running out of time and um, I leave for my trip and it, it still is not here. And about three or four days into my check, um, I got an email saying that my medication was being overnighted <laughs> to my house here in the United States in the state of Maryland. So, um, not helpful. My, um, medication is still in the package. Um, so that is the first thing that I really wish I had. Um, and if you saw part one and part two of my um, check video, you <laughs> remember that I did get, I got very, very sick. And altitude sickness is one of those things that you just, you don't know if it's going to affect you and how it's going to affect you. But, um, I wish I had this. I don't know. I don't know if it would have helped. Um, I, I don't know how I would have reacted to it, but I definitely wish that I had it. Um, and I always suggest it just in case, just if you have the opportunity to get it, I would suggest getting it, even if you take it and don't use it. Um, I ran into several people on my way up the mountain and they had a ton of the medication with them and they didn't need it. They weren't sick at all. They, they had no symptoms. Um, and I did get some of the medication, like some very lovely fellow travelers did give me some of the medication. But um, honestly, because I, I did take some into the truck, it just... Um, it just seemed to give me a whole lot of other unpleasant symptoms and didn't seem to help any with the altitude sickness. Um, it just made me even more nauseous. Um, so get it, have it, take it with you. The number one piece of gear I wish I would have had, um, altitude sickness medication. Okay. Um, this one is great. Um, some camera filters. If you have a camera, if you're using a camera, um, I have a Canon mirrorless camera that I love, but I also love animals. And <laughs> anytime you have a camera and you're trying to film an animal, they always want to get right up into the lens and lick it and smell it and breathe on it. And my lens was filthy the entire time. Plus, um, it was rainy. It was very foggy. Like there were a lot of things that touched my, the actual glass of my camera and I dropped my camera a couple times straight into the dirt face down. Um, so the second thing would be a UV filter and I've known about these for a while. I've never used one. Um, I, I don't know why, like it's one of those things like I know I should use it, but I just haven't been using it. Um, if you're unfamiliar, a UV filter, it, works to just simply block some of the UV rays that are coming into your camera lens to kind of just help protect everything. It's also just a really good, even if you don't need the UV protection, um, it's also just a really good cover for the actual glass of your camera lens. Um, so if 
puppies and cows and <laughs> whatever else is touching the lens of your camera, um, they won't actually touch the lens. They'll touch this removable, um, this removable lens, and you can take it off and wipe it clean. Um, and it's a lot easier to care for than the actual glass of your camera. So this one is glass, um, and this is a great one. It's nice and inexpensive. I actually bought an entire um, kit, so this package has an entire um, kit of different lenses because I would like to try some other lenses besides one that just protects the camera itself. Um, so lenses are always a great fun option to try if you're looking to just kind of add some new things to your to your camera gear and obviously traveling with my camera it's my camera is probably my most important piece of gear <laughs> to me what makes everything so fun and this is not just the Everspace camp truck but what makes traveling in general so pleasurable is just having my camera with me um, it's with me. It's it goes everywhere with me. So lenses are great. Um, the next thing is um, some UV gloves for my hands. Um, I did have a big hat on and um, lots of sunblock everywhere. I did use sunblock on my hands, but my hands were always out and exposed to the sun. And I did end up getting a bit of a sunburn on the top of my hands just from spending over a week, a week and a half, just in the sun every single day, all day long. Um, so I found some very light, um, stretchy, um, they won't make you hot, so they're great for the summer, um, but just some UV gloves. They're just, they're like a sports shirt. Like if you've um, done any kind of athletic um, anything or maybe just gym wear, that really kind of light, stretchy shirt material. Um, this is that same material, but um, they simply um, go on like a glove. Um, I chose the fingerless option because I do need to be able to work my camera. <laughs> and, um, so these kind of look like 1980s fashion wardrobe items, but I have some gloves. I bought a two pack. So um, I have the, um, like a tannish color that's kind of skin color um, if I wasn't so white. Um, and then like a really soft, um, nice pretty pink so um, two pairs and um, they will just protect my um, hands and I, I always wear long sleeves always always um, I wear long sleeves um, but I'm constantly getting a sunburn on my hands um, especially the back of my hands and this one is nice because you can kind of tuck it down over your watch um, if you want to protect your your watch and um, keep that clean while you're while you're outside as well So UV gloves and I've actually made these for a really long time Like I said every time I come home from a trip. I have a sunburn <laughs> On the back of my hands and it, it goes like all the way up to like my watch And then you can like I take my watch off or put on a different one That's a different size and you can see the whole outline, but it's a whole big it's a whole big thing every time Okay, the next thing okay, Everspace camp is really cool it's like even going in may like in the summer it is cold i was always okay. always really cold and when i'm cold my nose runs a lot and it's not like a little trickle it's just straight up like it just <laughs> it just runs um and i did take a bandana specifically for the purpose of like if i need to wipe my nose um but the ones the bandanas that I have, they're just really rough. They're a very sort of abrasive material and they're 100% cotton. So how they're so rough, um, I, I don't know. They might be treated with some sort of um, flame retardant, but um, they're very texturized in an, in an unpleasant way to your face. So especially when it's cold and if you've been wiping your nose a lot and your nose gets really raw, um, the bandana was miserable trying to wipe my nose um with it and it just it it wasn't working so um i got a nice soft this is very soft this actually is <laughs> one of my table linens that um i just got that it's just the softest 
material that I have been able to find um, way softer than, than the handkerchiefs I was looking at. So um, I'm going to now carry with me um, this as a handkerchief and um, I wouldn't necessarily suggest disposable tissues because while they are soft, um, you'll just end up with a giant pocket full of like soaking wet tissues and they all come together and they just make a nasty mess and then um, when you're looking for other things in your pocket or zipping and unzipping your pocket um, they will just fly out and they go everywhere and um, you're chasing them down the side of the mountain and um, this is just a lot easier everything is just in one place one tissue um, these are great so it did work well for me to have a um, washable linen um, hanky um, but again just the bandana it just did not work and it's really um, bandanas are really really large so this um, <laughs> this giant thing um, it just it just takes up way more space like you don't need all of this um, to blow your nose even for me where mine was just and I was having to constantly blow it and I just had all kinds of stuff um, going on with my sinuses and um, it was just, it was still, it was just too big. So you don't want to pack more than you, than you have to. So a nice, really soft, washable linen. And then when you get back to your tea house each night, you can just wash it when you wash the rest of your laundry. So do wash your laundry. I wash my laundry every single day. So wash your laundry, just my suggestion and have a washable hanky. Okay, um, next is with the sports bras. I did not invest in a wool sports bra because they are quite expensive and I thought with something so small it drying fast enough would not be a problem um, but I was wrong when I wash my laundry even if all the rest of my clothes or most of my clothes dried my bras would still be wet for days and I only took two I took one black and I took one white and because I had one white wool shirt and one black wool shirt um and obviously I needed the white bra under the white shirt so that you couldn't see my bra like you couldn't see a big black bra under it um wool is relatively thin or I took summer wool so it was it was thin um so I needed a dark one and a light one these are a an athletic um very stretchy material like they kind of feel like leotards um they did not dry fast like I would have thought being a sports material and they are quick dry they did not dry quick <laughs> they did not dry quick um I really like the bras they're pro fit um it was my first time taking them on the trail um but two sometimes three days later my bras were still wet and when you only have two the one on your body and one extra one if it takes three days for it to dry um, it's just really not helpful. Your your check is halfway over by the time your underwear dries. So um, I did invest in a couple wool sports bras. Um, the brand I chose was Icebreaker. Um, they are a really great repeatable company. So I went with them and I ordered um, I ordered two because they were on sale. Um, so a good quick drying sports bra. You can wash them with the rest of your laundry and then hang them up. Um, I had a really nice laundry system and I'll make a whole separate video on laundry but um, a really good way to um, create a line for your bras to, to help them to dry fast but you really do want a wool bra um, otherwise you'll be <laughs> in a dirty bra for a long time and bras are because they're right up against your skin it's not like shirts and other clothing where at least you might have something on top of them um they're just right up against your skin and being that they're up next to your underarms um i had deodorant um i took deodorant with me um i am not um i am not a, a stinky hiker so i i showered every day i wash my laundry every day i put on deodorant um but i do want a clean bra so having a bra that dries quickly is really important so wool sports bra okay um, the next item is travel containers that have permanent marker, <laughs> have permanent marker to indicate what they are. What I did is I had 
all of these little bottles and I had taped a label indicating what was in each little bottle. Um, and then I dumped them sideways and I shook them and I gave them a little test at home and everything was fine, nothing leaked. Um, they were brand new bottles. Um, the, the bottle said that they were leak proof and that they were leak tested and, and I believed them. And, and I took just white piece of paper and then took some pink permanent marker and wrote on the piece of paper and then I put some scotch tape and just taped it multiple times around. And because I put so much tape in there, um, and it was permanent marker on the paper. Like I thought that I would have absolutely no problem. And what happened in reality is that they did all leak. Every single bottle, um, I think leaked. But what I ended up with is paper um, that you just, you cannot read. Um, so it just, it all made a big mess. And then the adhesive on the tape just leaked out everywhere. And it's it just, the bottles are so sticky. And I ended up, I couldn't tell what anything was. So I ended up every single night having to open every single bottle and try to smell it. And I try to buy products that are, have as little scent as possible. And being that they don't have a lot of scent, it was really hard to smell them to try to figure out what was shampoo and <laughs> what was face wash, what was body soap, what was laundry soap. Half the time I didn't know if I was putting conditioner in my hair or bug spray. <laughs> so um, that that was a really big problem. So the, the travel bottles are great. These are really tiny. I think these ones are a half an ounce um, and this is the one ounce size. And these were fantastic. These worked really great. You don't need a lot of products. So the bottles were great, but the labeling system that I made did not work. So um, in my gear, I just wish I had bottles that were actually usable, um, that were properly labeled with just a Sharpie. So um, here's my bottle with the Sharpie. This is my bug spray. Um, so like you said, like, I'm pretty sure that bug spray um, ended up, I probably sprayed it on my hair. I probably used it as sunblock a couple times. Like, who, who knows? Like, <laughs> who knows? Um, so I, I had been worried that the permanent marker would smear or that it wouldn't see on or that it would fade if it got wet. Um, so far so good. I will update after I've used it on a couple trips, but, um, permanent marker, permanent marker on your travel bottles. Um, wish I had that. Okay. And the very last thing that I'm going to cover in detail is going to be a buff. Okay, the thing about a buff, if you've watched any hiking video, everyone will have a buff on. Like pretty much everyone wears a buff all the time. Me, I've never seen the point in them. Um, I have a relatively skinny neck, so when I put buffs on, they typically like just hang down like a scarf. Um, <laughs> so like on a, on a buff, one size does not fit all. Um, but again, because it did get really cold and because I was having a really hard time, like with my nose running and with like my throat was so incredibly swollen and sore and it caused like all kinds of sinus issues because I was breathing in so much cold air, especially as you get higher, uh, about day six, maybe day five or day six, w whenever it started snowing, um, it was a problem and in the tea houses when it was literally 32 like literally freezing 32 degrees fahrenheit it was very cold in the tea houses i ended up just wearing like a, a normal like medical mask to try to help keep my warm moisture in um and to help kind of block some of the cold air um to just kind of make breathing a little bit easier um and it worked but it wasn't the best um, and then the mask again, like if you're no start running and then like the mask is just, it's just, it's not a pretty, <laughs> it's not a pretty picture. Um, it's not pretty. Plus it's just not pretty. Like it's just not a pretty way to hike. Um, so at least the buffs give you more protection. So it covers your neck. Um, it can cover, I mean, as high as you pull it up. Um, if you wanted to probably double layer it and kind of flip it up, you could probably do that um, if you need something a little bit thicker. Um, so I actually got this. I've had this for a long time. I've had it for a really long time and I've just never felt the need to use it, but I will definitely be, I'm going to 
practice with it since I I'm not used to them it'll probably take trying it a couple times to really get used to but I did really wish I had a buff and I remember there was a very specific point where I was walking in a mask looking ridiculous and it not helping very much um, and I was thinking like gosh I even debated whether or not to bring this buff and I chose not to like I packed it and then unpacked it and packed it and unpacked it and again when you're concerned about every single gram um, because especially if you're going without a porter and you're going to carry everything yourself, um, you, have to, you have to be really careful about weight. And I just didn't want to take something if I wasn't going to use it. Um, so I definitely wouldn't suggest taking gear that you haven't already started incorporating into your normal hiking routine. Um, if you're not used to it, like you're probably not going to, not going to use it when you go in. Um, it's really lightweight. This one is solid wool because it's, it's wool is just really lightweight. Um, so I'm really excited to take this out and start, um, to start trying it, but a buff. Okay. The last item, again, if, if you watched my part one and part two, to my track, um, <laughs> you will know that my feet gave me a lot, a lot of problems. Uh, I thought I brought my boots over. Um, I have hiking boots that I really like. The problem, the problem is that going downhill and there's a lot of downhill and it's a very steep downhill is that my feet were sliding and slamming into the front of my boot and it hurts. Like it feels like you're slamming into concrete at a high speed. Um, and every single time you take a step with each foot, it's just slamming, slamming, slamming. Um, and it's really painful. My toes are still black. Um, I stopped, I finished my hike about six weeks ago. Um, and I did some more traveling and then I was, I stayed in Nepal for a while to, to do, um, to do some other traveling, but it's been about six weeks since I finished my trek and my toes are still black. They're still black. So even after all that time, like they looked like horrible when it, when it first happened, it's like, oh my gosh, I don't, no, I didn't even know their toes could look like that. But um, six weeks later, they're still they're still pretty terrible. Um, so I am currently awaiting in the mail a whole bunch of different remedies that I'm going to try for the feet. But I do wish that I had something to help keep my feet from from slamming into the front of my shoe. And I know that's a common problem. If you haven't heard about it, it's called hiker's toe. <laughs> for a very good reason. Hikers, when you go downhill, um, it's a very, very common problem. Um, I didn't realize how common it was until I started researching to try to figure out some solutions. Um, so take your shoes out um, and practice, just go up and down hills. Just go down and just make sure it's not, you're not gonna have a problem with your toes. Um, I would say mine, my feet started hurting day one, just because of the downhills with my toes, day one. And then I was like limping, and then by two day two, it was it, it was just a continuation of the problem. And several days in, like I thought I was going to die. Like my feet hurt so bad, and it was just the big toes. It was just the big toes. But when any part of your foot hurts, and you try to start using different muscles in different parts of your feet to try to eliminate some of the pain on, on your feet, then it's like other areas are hurting. So when you walk forward, the natural inclination of your feet is to like use pressure on your toes, especially your big toe to propel yourself forward. And if you're trying to not let your toes touch anything and you're walking like with your toes lifted um, or like angled weird in your shoe, it's just, you're just gonna be walking funny. And then my the balls of my feet started hurting, my ankles started hurting, the heels of my feet, like my arches, everything else started hurting. Um, but the big problem was my toes. So, um, I, I think tomorrow, um, I have some new shoes coming. I'm going to try just a whole bunch of different, um, remedies to try to see if I can't help my feet, but definitely, um, the last thing I would recommend is just make sure that you aren't going to have a problem in particular with your toes. Like I had my feet measured, um, professionally measured, and I went to a professional, like a sporting goods store to get help picking out the boots that I have right now, the ones I've had for the last couple years. Um, and even with all that, I've changed my socks several times. I now wear toe socks and like, I made a lot of changes, but I still have a problem with my feet just slamming into the tips. So 
that is no fun. That will ruin <laughs> a good time very quickly. So those are my seven plus a tiny little bonus tip on just gear that I really wish I had when I did my Mount Everest base camp trek. Um, let me know if you have anything to add or if you have any questions. Oh, and I bought all of these items with my own money at full price, and I've linked the items in the description below in case they can help any of you. Okay, I'm going to show you my toenails, but caution, if you don't want to see, avert your eyes. Avert your eyes. All right. Lots of bruising still. Poor feet. <laughs> my feet are asleep. <laughs>